welcome all of you to tonight's uh, lecture series and event. I encourage you to uh, find a place to not only be able to sit, but to see, to hear, uh, to learn, and uh, appreciate being in this uh, wonderful uh, uh, facility here in the uh, Science Building. Uh, great lecture hall where everybody, I think, can see uh, without any problems at all. Uh, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Chad Thornhill, who is the uh, uh, chairman of our Biblical and Theological Studies Department, who will introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. William Mounts. Uh, those of you that have taken Greek will recognize uh, his name immediately from your grammar or your dictionary, uh, but uh, I'm going to let Chad uh, come in here and uh, give the official formal introduction. Uh, so uh, give our local guy a good hand here. Here we go. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get things to come. Father, we're grateful. Um, Lord, we're grateful for your word, and your word reveals truth to us. Uh, God, it tells us and shows us who you are, and uh, we're, we're grateful for men like Dr. Mounts, uh, men and women who uh, bring us effectively your word in the original languages into our language uh, that we can understand. So we thank you for this evening where we can reflect on uh, how your word has made its way into English and into other languages as well. And um, Lord, we're grateful that you work um, through people, that you're a God who, who loves and relates to us. So we pray that you would bless this evening, bless our speaker. Uh, Lord, may we all learn and, and grow through this evening uh, to better appreciate what you've communicated to us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, before I introduce our, our guest, um, I would like to thank Dr. Ross. She has worked uh, a lot over the last few weeks to help put the details of this week together. Uh, Dr. Mouse is going to be speaking tonight and tomorrow night on um, the uh, Bible and Bible translation related issues and, and the reliability of Scripture. Uh, so we invite you to come back here uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. If you're interested, we should have room. Uh, we moved this from our building because we anticipated we'd have a bigger crowd than we could fit in our largest classroom. So I'd like to thank her. We would give her a round of applause. Uh, we would also like to welcome the folks from the linguistics department here who are joining uh, us at the School of Divinity and hope that this will... Uh, be a night where we all can, can learn and grow and share together. So, without further ado, you're not here to hear of me, you're here to hear from Dr. Mounts. So, Dr. Bill Mounts is the founder and president of biblicaltraining.org. Go ahead and write that website down, because uh, not only does it have resources that you're going to want to access, but it has resources for you to pass along uh, related to some basic discipleship and uh, an intro to the Bible type, type issues. It's a phenomenal resource that um, Dr. Mounts is really committing his life work to uh, resourcing the church now, uh, which I think is, is a wonderful, beautiful thing. His scholarship is translating um, into real practical tools for, for believers all across the globe. Uh, he also serves on the Committee for Bible Translations, which is responsible for the NIV translation. Anybody ever read the NIV? Okay. Uh, and has also done committee work for the ESV translation. Uh, very famously, as uh, many of us know him from, he wrote uh, probably the most widely used Greek grammar in the history of Greek grammars, which is basically biblical Greek, a phenomenal resource if you haven't taken Greek. Uh, it's a great way to introduce yourself to the language. So would you please join me in Dr. and welcoming Dr. Bill Nounce. Hello. My hello. Hello. Yeah, there is, there is. hello. <laughs> All right, let's 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 start off in figuring out uh, who I'm talking to. How many people here use the NASP? All right, all right. <laughs> you, got, you got a clap from up front. How many of you use the ESP? <laughs> As normal, quite aggressive. Uh, <laughs> CSP. That's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, this is the South, isn't it? I just want to make sure Virginia is still considered South. You, you're considered South in terms of humidity. Isn't it? I grew up in Minnesota, Kentucky. I, I asked the Lord, I'll do anything you ask me to do except 
working in a climate of humidity. <laughs> so I live in the Pacific Northwest. All right, uh, NIV. Yeah. Yeah, all right, there you go, there you go. Uh, NRSV. <laughs> yeah, academics. Uh, King James. Okay, a few. And let's see, I know I left one out. Net Bible. Uh, Net Bible is the is one of the big unknown Bibles. It's done mostly by professors from Dallas Seminary. And when I, I was at Dallas earlier this year, and almost no one uses it at Dallas, which just shocked me. I was surprised. Anyway, okay, so pretty wide range, a little little more on the uh, formal equivalent side, but that that's that's good. That's good. All right. Well, what I want to talk tonight is on um, one of my many pet peeves. And that is, in theory, how many different forms of translation theory are there? In the past, we've talked about basically there's two ways to translate a Bible. You can have a formal equivalent uh, translation, and the formal equivalent translation is one that sticks more closely to the uh, grammar of the Greek and of the Hebrew. Uh, formal equivalent tend to do concordance, and concordance is the attempt to translate the same Greek or Hebrew word with the same English word, so you can kind of trace the, the connections through the translation. And formal equivalents really try not to change the order, and I'm going to be most, sorry, I'm going to be mostly Greek today. So, are you okay? You're used to that? Yeah, okay. Most of my week is Greek. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, and what they, what formal equivalent tends to do is go along and translate the Greek as it, as it is until it simply doesn't mean anything. And then they, they look at what it does mean and say, okay, how do I say the same thing in English? But sticking as close as possible, as closely, my mother would not like it, I didn't use an adverb, as closely as possible to the Greek structures. The other kind of translation theory that we're used to talking about is, it used to be called functional equivalent, or I mean dynamic equivalent, and people tend to prefer more functional equivalent. Uh, and functional equivalent translations are designed to look first and foremost at the meaning. And then how do I convey that same meaning that the Greek author was, was wanting to express into the target language? They're all about um, authorial intent. What is the intent of the author? And in my own travels, I've gone from first year Greek teaching to the, I was the New Testament chair of the ESV for 10 years, and that's the formal equivalent and sticking to the words. And, and now I'm on the CBT, as they said, which is the uh, committee that controls the NIV, which is the, uh, the dynamic or functional um, kind of translation. And it's been a real interesting journey as I've gone through these different stages in my own life, and the, the problem that I see is as people talk about translations, is that they try to cram translations into one of these two categories. And the problem is that the pushing all translations into one of these two categories, it blurs some phenomenally important distinctions. Um, the NIV and the NLT, for example, are very similar in other ways, and they are really different in other ways. And they simply can't belong in the same category. They're just too different. And some translations will go along, uh, like the ESV, it'll be a formal equivalent, and all of a sudden it gets really functional. It goes, whoa, am I in the NLT committee now? Uh, you know, it's like that I you know, go to sleep and I change committees. And this is just the way translations are. The NIV can be very formal equivalent in places, and then it, it morphs into a functional. And so this whole idea of two different kinds of translations, and then a line where you have these hash marks that represent the different translations, they're just confusing because there's overlap in the Bibles, and then the problems go on and on. So I've been trying to encourage people to think more in terms of five different categories of translation. So what I want to do is to go through the, what I consider the five categories and kind of put your different translations in the category I think they belong. And then when we're done, we'll open it up and, uh, for questions. So that's what I want to do. Uh, the first category, I tend to fidget when I talk. Oh, oh well, that's okay. <laughs> My hand's off it. Um, the first category, I can't find a word for. <laughs> and I'm going to use the word literal. 
I don't like the word literal. I think it's a stupid word. I think it's a wrong word. I think it conveys the wrong ideas, but I can't find a different way. In fact, if you want to go on YouTube and Google Bill Mount's literal translation, you'll see what I really think of this word. The problem is the word literal has to do with meaning. It doesn't have to do with form. Open up any English dictionary and look up the word literal. And you'll see that it, the word literal means without embellishment. In other words, technically, the word literal has nothing to do with translation at all. So if I say earlier, I guess it was yesterday, it's raining cats and dogs. I mean, literally, it's raining cats and dogs. See, that is an accurate use of the word. It's a metaphor, but I did it without embellishment. We understand the metaphor to mean it's just Florence is hitting and it's just pouring down rain, Right? I mean, it's really, really raining. That's what the metaphor, cats and dogs, mean. And so if I say it's literally raining cats and dogs, that's, that's what the word literal means. If I can say, um, I'm 65 years old. Well, literally, I, I am 65. I'm not 64. I'm not 66. I am 65. That's what the word literal means. And the, the problem that happens in Bible in discussions of Bible translation is that if you ask the average Joe Blow on the street, and say, what kind of Bible do you want? Um, the answer usually is, well, I want a literal Bible. And you say, if you say, what do you mean by literal? What they mean is, I want one that's accurate. I want one that's not uh, interpretive. We're going to talk about that in a second. I want one that doesn't that, that is actually what the original authors meant to say. And the problem is they equate that with word-for-word -word translation. This is the problem of literal. The word literal means without embellishment, saying actually what you intend to say. The English word has nothing to do with translation theory, hence the problem. But I can't find a better word. The only example that we have of a literal translation is an interlinear. Okay, you know what interlinears? They'll have the Greek words, and every Greek word, they'll be an English word, what that word literally means. And I've written about four of these, so I mean, I kind of like interlinears. But the, the problem is not even, in, interlinears aren't even literal. Even in writing out an interlinear, a word-for-word -word translation, you're making interpretive decisions all the time. Uh, for you, I, I, if you were in some of the earlier classes today, we talked about this, but I'm going to repeat some of my illustrations. But in Romans 3.22, here, here's Romans 3.22, word for word. Righteousness but of God through faith of Jesus, of Christ, into all the believing, not for it is distinction. Now, is that, is that English? <laughs> no, it's not English. It's English words, but it's not English. You would have been failed in your high school English class if you turned in a paper <laughs> like that. But even in translating as stilted as that, I did all kinds of interpretive uh, gymnastics to get it. For example, one of the Greek words is theu. Theta, epsilon, omicron, epsilon. Now, Greek students, give me the literal translation of theu. Of God. Of God. Really, where's the preposition in theu? Implied. Oh, it's implied. In the case. Oh, it's in the case, in the genitive case. So you interpreted the genitive case with a preposition of. Is that literal? No, it's not literal. <laughs> Fact of the matter is, we don't have a genitive case in English, so you have to interpret. Now, is that what they means? Sure. But is it literal? No, it's not literal. Because you had to change it. All the way through there, um, I've had to make it you know, through faith of Jesus of Christ. Well, it's genitive, so you think of Jesus, but it's faith in Jesus. It's not faith of Jesus, it's faith in Jesus. So this, this is the problem with, with uh, thinking that there's no interpretation going on, even in interlinears. The fact of the matter is, and, and I'm taking the borrowing this from Mark Strauss. Mark is a professor at San Diego in Bethel West. I guess they don't call it Bethel West, no. They just call it, I think they just call it Bethel. Anyway, he's on the CDT with me, or I'm on with him. 
And Mark's illustration is, what is the literal meaning of the word, are you in? If you can have a literal translation, certainly words have to have literal meanings, right? So what's the literal meaning of the word, are you in? There isn't one, is there? You can, you can run off at the mouth. You can run up your school debt. You can run a business. You can run down that incredible football field if you all have fun, goodness. Um, I mean, there is no literal meaning for the word R-U-N. It only has meaning in context. And so when you start talking about literal translations, you run into all kinds of problems. And, and I would argue that this discussion wouldn't even happen outside of the whole issue of Bible translation. If you get into linguistics, and this I have a couple of your professors here. Uh, you're, you're, you're translating from Mandarin into Swahili. This debate wouldn't even occur. You, you wouldn't even begin to go, think you could go word for word and make any sense. I was able to go to Shanghai a couple of years ago and I was speaking to an audience and I was talking about the Sermon on the Mount and I talked about um, straddling a fence. Jesus doesn't allow us to straddle a fence. We have to choose. So I said straddle a fence. And right when I said it, I don't speak Mandarin, and I, I stopped and I said, I thought to myself, I've never seen a fence in Shanghai, except around where they're building. There's no fences between yards. Do they have fences in China? I don't know. So I stopped and I, but the translator just translated it and the, and the people had, you know, what is he talking about? So I stopped and I said, what did you just say? And she smiled and she said, the closest idiom that we have is a foot in two boats. Isn't that cool? A foot and two boat. Mm -hmm. That had conveyed the meaning very, not perfectly, I'm told, but pretty well. But is it literal? No, of course not. In terms of being word for word. That's not how languages function. So we have this category of literal or essentially literal translations. But I just think it's linguistic nonsense. I just, I just don't think it even works. So that's the first category. I had to find a place to, to put in our linears. The second form of Bible translation is formal equivalent that I introduced at the beginning. So formal equivalent translations try to reflect the formal structures of the original text and making the original, say, transparent to the reader. They want you to be able to look at the English and see the Greek and the Hebrew through it. And that means if it's an indicative verb in Greek, you translate an indicative verb in English. If it's a Participle, you translate it as a participle, if it's a preposition, you translate it as a preposition, you try to maintain concordance, again, which is a good idea in and of itself. And then what, what happens is you're, you're translating along, and all of a sudden, going word for word doesn't make any sense. So, I mean, we would do this on the ESV all the time. We'd go along and we'd try to stick to word order, we'd try to watch our concordance issues, and then like every committee has to deal with, we'd hit a group of words that would go, there's just no way that's going to convey any meaning. So we stop, and this is formal equivalent, remember. You stop, and you say, well, what does it mean? Then how do I convey the same meaning in English? So even formal equivalent translations in almost every verse have to stop and look at what it means and say, how do I say the same thing in English? So the New American Standard would fit in this category, the ESV, uh, the CSV, and if you take out the gender language, the NRSV does. When you read the, the NRSV, it can feel like it's just this mega paraphrase. And, but if you take the gender issues, because they make singulars into plurals, they make third persons into second persons, <laughs> all these ways to get away from saying the word he or man. Um, the actual translation is very much word for word. It's a very good translation. Um, but it, it has social and political and different other kind of associations, National Council of Churches kind of stuff, that, that it's not been accepted much by evangelicals. But anyway... One of the things that I really like about formal equivalent translations is they work very hard to maintain the distinction between a translator and a commentator. 
And, and they work really hard at this. And we, we would time and time and time again on the ESV and on the NIV, we'd be translating along, and we, you know, that's not really clear. That's not really understandable. We all know that it means this. Can we say it? And the question is always, are we being translators or are we being commentators? If, do we need to say this and let the people figure it out? Or do we need to help by explaining a little more of what it means? And this division uh, between being a, a translator and a commentary writer is really honored by formal equivalent translations. Uh, and also by quite a few of the functional as well. But that's one thing that it does very, very good. But understand, when you do that, you're still being interpretive. I, I hear that, well, I want a Bible that's not interpretive. And I go, great, I've got one. It's called the Nestle Lot 28. It's on my phone. Okay, this is the only uninterpretive New Testament there is. Well, that's not actually true. Now, you know text criticism? <laughs> Okay, the Romans 5, 1, does Paul say, we, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God? Or does he say, having been justified by faith, let us pursue peace with God? It's the difference between echomen and echomen. Did you hear that? <laughs> uh, one's an indicative, one's a subjunctive. So even the Nestle Elan folks have had to make that decision. Is it echomen or echomen? So even this is interpreted, Right? <laughs> but it's um, I'm sorry but the, the point is we have to interpret Greek likes to leave out direct objects it does it all over the place and if you're reading along and you'll hit a transitive verb and you go okay <laughs> or Paul likes to use combinations with the word soon that means with a co-worker is with with whom Paul <laughs> I, I don't know who the other person is that you're talking about that we're co-workers with. That doesn't help me, Paul. So Greek likes to leave out words in different situations. It loves to use pronouns where you and I would have to give the antecedent. It's just because it's so confusing. I counted one verse in, uh, in CSB that had he five times, three times of Jesus, two times of a person. He, 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 he. Greek likes that. English doesn't. All right. Uh, Greek likes long sentences. Okay, Ephesians 1, with the 3 to 14, is one sentence. No one in English is going to translate as one sentence. Not the King James, not the ESV. We break them down into different number of sentences. And when you break a sentence, you've got to supply words. You have to be interpretive. That's the point I'm trying to make. That even formal equivalent translations must, by the very nature of language, be interpretive. Now, they try to hold the interpretation to a minimum. But again, I've been told, oh, I just want a Bible that's not interpretive. And I go, it doesn't exist. There's no such thing. That's not the way language functions. But form equivalent tried to maintain that pretty strictly, that, that distinction. Okay? Another thing I want to say about formal equivalent translations is the whole issue of ambiguity. Ambiguity is hard. English, any language, I think, is the stringing of one ambiguity after another. It's just how I look at language. Uh, it's really, really, really hard to be precise. And you normally have to say a series of words. You have to say them in context. And even then, things can be unclear. Uh, for example, I used, this, I used this illustration earlier. But if I were talking and I said um, something about a plethora, I can see on your faces, you don't know one of the greatest movies of all time. Someone in my generation, if you say plethora to, they start laughing. This is Chevy Chase's Three Amigos. I do not think you know what the word plethora means. <laughs> now, what if I say, uh, oh, what was the other word I came um, Inconceivable. <laughs> oh, now that movie's just as old as the Three Amigos, but Princess Bride is the, has a larger cult following has lasted a lot longer. <laughs> and you hear what's-his-face say inconceivable when it is conceivable because the boat with the black knight or whatever his name is is catching up. See, you hear these words and there's no ambiguity in your head because you have a larger context. And the problem with translation is we don't have a context. We have bits and pieces of the context, 
But there's so many things we don't know. And one of the real interesting questions in translation theory is, is the Bible ambiguous? And there are people that will argue that in its original context, when it was stated to people who spoke Greek as a native language, or as, I mean, they were all bi and trilingual, so maybe it was a, a secondary language. Um, was there ambiguity? And there's a lot of people that argue no. The ambiguity, the problems that come up that we have to deal with as translators comes up because we don't know enough. So Paul tells the Corinthians that uh, the, the love of Christ constrains me. Love of Christ keeps me from sinning. What does that mean? Well, it can mean two things in English, can it? Love of Christ, Greek people, can mean objective or subjective gender, right? So it could be Christ's love for me, or it could be my love for Christ. Now, if you read any commentary, I think they all say it's got to be Christ's love for me, because my love for Christ is not the standard by which I want to live my life. Because my love for Christ ebbs and flows. I'm a sinner, doing good one day, and not doing very good the next day, just like you. Um, it's, um, I really believe that what holds me secure is the fact that Christ loves me. So when the ESV, and I believe the NIV, say the love of Christ, what they're doing is they're leaving it open-ended. They're leaving it ambiguous. They're asking you to figure it out for yourself. And if that's the purpose of the translation, fine. The NLT, on the other hand, hates ambiguity. They refuse ambiguity, and they interpret every single genitive there is. So the NLT is Christ's love for me constrains me. So okay, this is just differences in theories. But the point is, when it comes to ambiguity and accuracy, you can't have both. All right? You, you can't claim, well, I'm going to be ambiguous, and that's accurate. The more ambiguous you are, the less accurate you are. Accuracy has to do with conveying the accurate meaning that was intended by the author. And you, if you read, you, no translator will disagree with this, that some Bible marketers do. I'll uh, leave it at that. Not Zondervan. <laughs> but you can't have ambiguity and, and accuracy at the same time. It just, it just, it's not the way things work. Um, formal equivalent tend to be more ambiguous. Uh, ESV intentionally so. If we thought that there was any chance that the Greek was ambiguous, we looked for an equally ambiguous English expression to put in its place. And we said, it's up to you. You figure it out. More formal equivalent translations will go, now if that's too confusing, if people are going to misunderstand it, then we're going to help them a little more because we're really convinced it's Christ's love for me. And we're going to actually put that into the translation. But this whole issue of ambiguity is, is very interesting. And again, this is something Mark Strauss is pushing on me all the time. And that is in the original context, he says, I doubt maybe 5% of the Bible is ambiguous. Maybe 5% of it wasn't clear. Yes, Peter says, Paul, he's hard to understand. He wasn't saying Paul was ambiguous. He just said the concepts were difficult to understand. And so to the original audience, things were clear. Then your translation, I think, should also be clear. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Did I hear it? No? <laughs> okay. I'm reacting against the claim that ambiguity is a good purpose that formal equivalent translations pursue. And this is not just the ESV. It's, it's translations to say, we're going to barely translate this just barely enough so you, if you work really hard, you can try to figure it out for yourself. And that, that's their right. That's their translation philosophy. But when I hand a Bible, when I was pastoring to my people in my church, when I handed Bibles to my kids, I wanted them to understand it. And I wanted Bibles that were not as ambiguous. I wanted Bibles that were clear so my kids could hear the plain news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I wanted. And so I resist this idea that ambiguity is a good thing. It's not a good thing, I don't think. 
Unless the Greek is truly ambiguous and we simply don't know what it means, then be ambiguous. Another thing that comes up with form, I'm going to pick on formal equivalent a little more than I normally do, but that's okay. Another, um, another thing I hear about formal equivalent translations is that we like them because we can see the Greek structure reflected in them. And there's some real truth to that. Okay, you can, you can read the, the Great Commission and you can see that there's one imperative, which is make disciples. And there's two participles, baptizing and teaching. That's how you, that's how you clone, right? That's how you make disciples. Evangelism, illustrated in their baptisms, discipleship, seen and teaching them everything. Okay, what about that go, though? Everybody translates this as an imperative, right? Everybody. I don't think there's an exception to that. It's not an imperative. It's a participle. Just like baptizing, just like teaching. Well, see, there's only one command in the Great Commission. It's to make disciples. How do you do it? You do it. There's three components. Since we're to make disciples of all nations, we have to go. So one way to fulfill the Great Commission is going to all the nations. Uh, another part of the Great Commission is evangelism. Another part of the Great Commission is teaching. So if a church claims to be a Great Commission church and doesn't do all three, guess what? It doesn't know it's Greek. Because only a church that does all three is a Great Commission church. So, but here's the point. If you think that formal equivalents are always going to be showing you the Greek structure behind, you're never going to see that in the Great Commission. Because you're not going to see that go is a participle. And there's only one imperative in the entire passage. So, yeah, formal equivalents are good. It's a nice crux a bit for Greek students to kind of see the structure of a sentence and, and work it out. But I don't think there's a single verse in the New Testament that doesn't diverge from its Greek structure. So how do you know when you're seeing Greek structure and how do you know when you're seeing English? Make sense? Be very careful when someone says, I like this translation because I can see the Greek structure behind it. If they can see the Greek structure behind it and if they can benefit from that, they should be reading Greek. I, I wonder why people think it's important to see the Greek structure in verses when they don't know Greek. So anyway, this, this whole thing of reflecting Greek structure is something to be careful of. Now, say a very positive thing about uh, formal equivalent translations, I like concordance. Uh, we work really, really, really hard on concordance in the ESV especially. Uh, it was part of our, our core translation philosophy to try to translate the same Greek word with the same English word. The problem is that languages aren't codes. And we don't have exact equivalences in English for the Greek words. And again, if you know multiple languages, you go, well, obviously. I mean, the word ha in Greek, what does it mean? What's its literal meaning? Well, it can mean go. It can mean possessive pronoun can be a relative pronoun, can be a weak demonstrative, can be a grammatical indicator with no lexical meaning, ha anthropos ha agathos, I should change that to uh, a good woman. Anyway, uh, ha anthropos ha agathos is the, the man, the good. The second the is, has no lexical meaning, is simply saying this is an adjective modifying the preceding noun. You, you just... You can't do concordance because we don't have exact equivalences. Uh, Greek students, what does is, what is sarx mean? Flesh. Really? And why does Paul use it to speak of our sinful nature? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is a flexible word. Why does, I get the numbers here. The, uh, the ESV translates Sarx, it occurs 147 times, it translates Sarx 24 different ways. That's the ESV. Logos, the word Logos occurs 334 times, 
And NASB, which is beautifully consistent in this issue, translates it 36 different ways. You, you just can't do concordance. So it's wonderful when it works out because it gives the English reader the ability, oh, same Greek word, same Greek, I can, I can follow it through. The most difficult passage, I think, to translate when it comes to concordance, that's why I've got my phone here, is in 1 Timothy 2. And when I went to Gordon Conwell, everyone has to give a lecture to, um, it's part of the process of seeing whether they'll hire you or not. And I thought I would handle, uh, head this issue straight on. And uh, let me read it out of, I'm going to read it out of the ESV. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do any of That illustrates it better. I'm sorry. First of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. My daughter goes, oh, okay, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> or she goes, oh, no one's praying for me. They're praying for Tyler and Hayden, not me. It says men. I'm not a man. Here's the problem in this passage. For kings and all are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. Oh, I guess my daughter's not one of the elect. I'm not sure I like this thought. Anyway, who desires all men to be saved. And to come to a knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay. Now, heads up, that's an impossible passage to translate if you care about concordance. Because what happens is if you don't say up at the beginning, pray for all men, you lose the connection that God wants all men to be saved. And there's one mediator between God and men who is himself a man. You see the problem? You, it, it cries out for concordance to get the flow of the thought. And so, I mean, the ESV did a, a very good thing. They, they, they say up front, uh, prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving made for all people. And there's a footnote later down in the passage that says, oh, this is the same Greek word. We, we couldn't find a way to translate. I think the NIV does the same basic thing. We, we couldn't find a way to actually tie all the words together. So concordance is great when it works, but it, there's times where it doesn't work. Uh, NASB translates the Greek word polis a hundred and... Oh, I don't have it here. Uh, 163 times, I think it is, the city. The city of Nazareth. Okay, you can't comment here if you were in class earlier. How many people lived in Nazareth when Jesus was there? Well, so yeah, uh, 600. See, Nazareth wasn't a city. It was a wide spot in the road. It was, you know, they didn't have their own zip code. Um, you know, it's miscommunicating to translate Paulus to city when it comes to Nazareth. But that's what concordance can do. But concordance, if you can do it without miscommunicating, I think it's a good thing. But it's really, really hard to do. And in fact, in some passages... Absolutely impossible. Okay, well, I have one other thing. Yeah, I have one other thing to say. Now I'm going to flip over to functional. What about inspiration? Do you all believe in verbal plenary inspiration? Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you know what it is, you say, yeah. yeah. I believe in verbal plenary information. Well, verbal means that God used words. Plenary means that all of it is inspired. So if we believe in verbal plenary inspiration, shouldn't we translate every word? And the, the charge is sometimes made that formal equivalent translations have a higher view of inspiration. I'm an emeritus, I believe in, in, the, in the full inspiration, the full authority of scripture, but I understand that there are words that simply can't be translated. Ha anthropos, ha agathos. Nobody translates the man to good. Nobody. So everybody leaves out that ta that's in there, or the ha that's in there. Verbal plenary inspiration means that all the scripture is from the mouth of God, and that God did not inspire by giving ideas. He, he gave words. He gave specific words and specific ideas. Well, specific, specific words, let's say, 
to the biblical writers. They were, as Peter says, they were carried along by the Spirit as they wrote. That says nothing about how to translate those words. I'm working on a paper. If you go to ETS, I'll have this in more formal uh, shape in, in a little bit. But some words simply don't have a semantic meaning. They have a grammatical function. Some words can't be translated unless you translate them as a group, as a phrase. And what's inspired is that fundamental idea that, that God inspired the writer to say. Now he's going to say it in his own idiom, both in Greek and in his personal idiom, and our job is to say the same thing in our idiom. But I've got to tell you, I've been, I've been on two committees, and I have never seen two groups of people more committed to the authority of Scripture in my life. And to say that one group has a higher view of inspiration than the other is just simply wrong. I've watched, okay, ladies, I was going to use this illustration. I have to remember. This is a strange verse in Numbers that is prohibiting women from wearing chains around their ankles. So we come to that in the NIV. We can't say chains because of the sex trade. So we have to come up with a different word. So you've got to understand, mostly older guys in the committee Say, what do we call these ornamental things that ladies wear around their ankles? And some of the older guys said, um, footies. What <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we did. The young guy went, footies. That's, that's, that's the bracelet. No, footies is the half nylon thing, isn't it? At least that's what they used to be called. This sounds here. That's not, no, no, it's a footie. No, no, they're anklets. Anklets? What's an anklet? The older guys would say, Look, it's pressure. No, that's not. And we, I finally asked, I called my wife. And I said, Will you please put a poll on Facebook and figure out what those things are called? And the NIV followed this Facebook uh, <laughs> poll. <laughs> and they're called Anglets in the NIV. It's, it's a prohibition about imitating Canaanite worship practices. It's not a prohibition against decorating your ankles. Why do you want to do that? I have no idea. But um, I'm not a woman. Um, the, the, these are the kind. These are the fun kind of days in translation. Uh, we spent a we spent a day and a half talking about the word surely uh, this last summer in Colorado Springs, meeting where I met you guys supposedly. <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about Shirley. Right, Shirley's an old word. Nobody says Shirley except Laverne and Shirley if you watch your reruns. Mm -hmm. And you know if I say to you as English speakers, surely it's going to rain. I'm saying, yeah, it's going to rain. If you're British, you know what I just said. I don't think it's going to rain. The word surely means something fundamentally different on the other side of the pond. So we spent a day and a half changing surely's to truly's and indeed's and certainly's. And it was not our best day. I'd rather argue about it, but it's a lot more fun. Okay, here's the point I'm trying to make. All of the words in the Bible are from God. Every last single one of them. But that doesn't mean that one form of translation is better than another. I really have no idea how we got to talk about English. Right. Translation, the goal of translation is to say the same thing in the other language. Okay? And it doesn't mean you have to use, I would say, a participle to express a participle that the participle agree. Um, but anyway, this whole thing on inspiration is, uh, I gotta tell you, I, I, as I said, I sat on two committees and every person on the committee <coughs> is highly committed to the full inspiration of Scripture. It has nothing to do with how we think about translation. Anyway, let me, uh, let me go, let me finish, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So that's it on formal equivalent translation. I think pros and cons, okay? There's pros and cons. The next one is functional or dynamic equivalence. And the, the purpose of these translations is to convey the meaning of the original into the target language. And functional equivalent translations understand that it's not the issue of form, it's the issue of meaning. What does the text say? Now the downside for these kinds of translations is that you have to be a little more interpretive. You can't just translate the words. You have to figure out what did the author mean. And sometimes it's as simple as ha anthropos ha agathos, it means the good man. Of course, then you have to decide whether it's man or person, right? And is it good or is it another version of what that word means? And there's still some interpretation, but basically you see a construction like that. It's a good one. It's not a big deal. 
But in other situations, it does take more interpretation. And that's the trade-off. You can be more word for word and be less clear, more open to misunderstanding. Or you can be a little more interpretive and convey the original meaning more clearly. So the NIV, the Net Bible, and at times I think the CSB fits in this category. Now, one of the things I don't really like about functional equivalent translations is how they often don't pay attention to dependent and independent constructions. I'm going to geek out just a little bit here. But independent constructions are phrases or, or clauses that can stand on their own, the complete sentences. Make disciples of all nations. Dependent constructions or subordinate constructions are constructions that can't stand on their own. Teaching them, baptizing them. And I like knowing the distinction whether the Greek is dependent or independent. I think in terms of exegesis, it's helpful because the main thought of a verse is often in the independent verb. That's the main point the author is making. And then the dependent constructions, participles and prepositions and stuff like that, are augmenting it or helping to explain it or maybe elucidate or clarify or something what the main point is. So I... On the NIV, I, I tend to vote for translations that maintain the distinction between dependent and independent constructions. Uh, the problem is, you got to be really careful of not getting overly interpretive. That's the challenge on this kind of translation. Let me give you an example. Acts 20, 11, Paul is on his way to uh, Rome for trial, and a storm hits, and the sailors are afraid that the ship's going to run aground on the Syrtis. That's how the ESV translates it. What on earth is the Syrtis? Does, does that convey any meaning to anyone? Well, you could probably figure out when he talked about running aground that probably the water's getting shallow, they're throwing out the sea anchors, they're, they're measuring the depth, so you could, you could figure out that the, the water level's um, getting, it's getting shallower. But still to say to run the ground on the Syrtis is kind of weird. It's interesting, you know, the NASB has this habit of adding words but italicizing them. And the problem is it doesn't italicize all the words it adds, <laughs> but it, uh, it, it does that. And it says the shallows of the Syrtis and it italicizes the word shallows. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. The NIV says, run aground on the sandbars of the Syrtis. Like, you see what we just did? Is the Greek word sandbars there? No. But Syrtis by itself doesn't mean anything. And everyone knows there's giant sandbars in that part of the, of the ocean. And so, it happened before I was on board. <laughs> no pun. Um, I was on the committee, and they translated sandbars of the Syrtis. Now the NLT, which is in the fourth category of natural language, says the sandbars of the Syrtis off the North African coast. See what they're doing? They're assuming that everyone in the ancient world knew what the Syrtis was and where it was. And since we don't, they're telling us. Okay, that's interpretation. That's a lot of interpretation. All right. uh, the, the ship that Paul was on was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods. And some translations will do capital T, capital G, which is the right way to do it uh, if you're going to translate it that way because they're the Zeus's twin gods. They were, they were Diodorus and Sycolus. So we know who they were. And so you have to capitalize twin gods. The NIV actually had, no, I'm sorry, it's Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux. The NIV actually puts Castor and Pollux in because we don't have a clue who the twin gods are. The ancients did. So we're, we're not adding controversial information, but we're trying to make sense so it actually means something to the reader. See, that's what I mean by where is this, how interpretive is the translation going to be, and at what point do you pass over from being a translator to being a commentator. Sometimes people use the phrase thought for thought for dynamic equivalent or, or functional equivalent translations. All translations are thought for thought. 
Every single one of them. It's just not a good label. The fourth category is natural language. And a natural language translation is a translation that it, it tries, it tries to, to do a translation so that the text hits the reader in the same way that the original reader heard it. They want it so much in your idiom, in your dialect, in the way that you speak, in the way that you think, that it's, it, it becomes really interpretive, but that's what it's trying to do. They want you to hear the text in the same way that the original audience um, did the text. SIL is almost all natural language, isn't it? Isn't that what they push toward? <coughs> you don't know. Okay, all right, all right. Eugene Nida, who's the, the father of all this, says, the purpose of a translation is to transport, quote, the message of the original text into the receptor language such that the response of the receptor is essentially like that of the original receptors. NLT is a beautiful illustration of natural language. The NLT people say, well, how do I say this? How do I say this? How do I say this? And it doesn't matter how the Greeks said it. The question is, well, how do I say it? Because that's the function, they would say, of a translation. To convey the meaning accurately, but said in the same way that you and I say it. Uh, there's a, uh, oh, I can, he won't care. Uh, I sit next to Mark Strauss a lot in the translation meetings. And Mark's from San Diego. He's bilingual with Spanish. Um, and so he has a whole different, plus he's been on the beach, I think, too much. And, uh, and uh, so Mark has a certain way of hearing things. And we'll be translating along. And I'll hear a mutter under his breath. Well, that's not how I say it. And I'll say, well, that's because you're from the beach in San Diego. I'm from the Northwest. You know, he's from Britain. He's from Britain. I mean, we just go back and forth on this. But what Mark is saying is that we need to seriously, and he's right to do this, we need to seriously think about how do you talk? Because if I if we translate in a way that it's not in your dialect, you don't understand it, or you don't, or you have to work to understand it. Uh, I really like the NLT. I'm going to say something harsh about it, but I want to preface it. I really like the NLT. Uh, when I want to see what a bunch of really smart people think the Bible means, I flip to the NLT all the time. Because it is substantially more interpretive than any other translation. And I can get, it's like reading a study Bible. I can get a quick look at seeing what Trimper Longman and, and these other people think the passage actually means, especially in the Old Testament. I'll get stuck and I'll go, what on earth does that mean? I'll, I'll go to the NLT, oh, that's what it means. Um, so I, there's things I really, really like about the NLT, but the problem with any natural language translation is that you don't know whether you're reading the Bible or whether you're reading the translators. The Bible does not say the Syracuse is on the North African coast. It doesn't say it. And when I read the Bible, I'm going to know what I'm reading at least is basically what the text said. So I really like the NLT. I've seen significant impact in my kids' lives and when I was pastoring in other people's lives. But there's so much of the translators in it that I get a little uncomfortable. Okay? So natural language is how do I say this in my dialect and I don't really care how the Greek is. Part of my problem also with these translations is when I, if I were to read Caesar's Gallic Wars and it read like a modern day comic book, well, I don't know, something's wrong here. Okay, Caesar was, I think, like 2,000 years ago, and wrote it in Latin, and it reflects an ancient culture, ancient times. And when I read an ancient book, I want to hear something that sounds like it's old. Not old in an old thou shalt kind of stodgy way, but I want to see it in its original context. I want to see it in its original culture. And natural language translations tend to pull books out of their original culture and put it into yours. So, natural language. The fifth and final, I, I don't have a word for this, um, but the paraphrase. The problem with the word paraphrase is it doesn't mean what we say it means. Uh, 
linguists use the term paraphrase to describe a rewording for the purpose of simplification in the same language. That's what a paraphrase is. So when Kenneth Taylor uh, paraphrased, I think it was the authorized version, was it? That living Bible is a true paraphrase. He started with an English and he ended with an English that was much easier to understand. So linguistically, it's wrong to talk about a Bible translation being a paraphrase. That's, that's, that's not what it is. But there is a category of translations that are so free <laughs> and, and so modern and so invented in places that they really need their own category. And that's why I'm saying there's five. You can't put the NIV and the NLT together, and you can't put the NLT with the Living Bible, even though it's a second, third generation of the Living Bible. Uh, J.B. Phillips' translation, have you ever seen it? Done by a, a Brit. Uh, my mom became a Christian reading that in C.S. Lewis, so I'm kind of partial to a J.B. Phillips. It is, it, is, it is worded in the way that only an Englishman can word something. Uh, there's a gift in the English language that Brits have that most of us simply don't possess, and J.B. Phillips had it. But it is really, really <laughs> different. <laughs> Um, Eugene Peterson's The Message fits in this category. Interesting book. He's a wordsmith. Uh, I don't think it's a Bible. Uh, Kenneth Taylor's original living Bible. I, I don't have it in my notes here, but greet one another with a holy kiss. If you go through the different translations, it's fun to see you do this. Uh, one of them says, shake hands warmly with one another. <laughs> that's actually a really, really good translation. Because that's exactly what Paul means. He, he, he's not saying, you know, give him a smack. He's saying use the customary form of, of fellowship, of interaction that people of the same faith have to greet them and welcome them into fellowship. Give them a holy kiss. So if you're Ukrainian, right, that's a kiss on the lips. Did you know that? Kiev. Kiev's in Ukraine, huh? Yeah. I was talking to a missionary friend of mine who's in the Ukraine. And... Yeah, I said, how do you deal with this men kissing men on the lips as a standard greeting? <laughs> I walk through church like this. <laughs> for others, it's a kiss on the cheek, right? Uh, for others, it's a hug. For others, it's, uh, it's a hearty handshake all around. See, this is, welcome to my world. This is what I get to deal with. And so as you look in these five different categories of translations, uh, the Romans 6, I think it's Romans 16, is, is a great test case to go to to see how they're handling what a holy kiss is. What is the best Bible out there? The best Bible is the one that you'll read and understand. That's the best Bible. My son read the ESV from cover to cover. I said, how did you do it? I hate him. He goes, didn't understand the word. I said, why'd you read it? He goes, I thought I should. Hmm. I said, can I give you another Bible? He goes, no. We only read the ESV in this house. <laughs> this is back when I was on the committee. He came home once. Just terrible. Dad, Dad, the, the preacher didn't preach out of the Bible. Said, really? Yeah, it didn't say Holy Bible on it. The ESV always says Holy Bible on it. <laughs> Um, he was he was he was going to use Dad's translation. Um, later on, he was in the Marines, and I said, "Can I send you a Bible?" And he goes, "Yeah, send me something else." Sent him an NLT. Came back, "How'd you do, Hayden?" I, said, I loved it. I read it from cover to cover. I understood it. He's now a world missions major at Multnomah University. A large uh, sorry, large part of that. You don't go to Bible business. <clears throat> the Marines are a cesspool of iniquity. But as a friend of mine said, the world is a cesspool of iniquity. And it will chew you up and spit you out if you're not careful. And they tried to get hit, but it didn't. So I said, hey, how'd you do with the NLT? He said, I love it, Dad. I could actually understand it. I could actually understand it. We get so involved in these translation wars. And, I mean, somebody shot a bullet through a TNIV and sent it to Biblical. They have it on display there. <laughs> good grief, people. We're about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with a perverse and dying generation. And some people are shooting bullets through the Bible because it says you instead of he. 
Get a life. <laughs> the best Bible is the Bible that you will read and that you will understand, but it's faithful to what the original authors wanted you to hear. All right? Now, I'm biased. <laughs> I love the NIV. I love the ESV. It was a really hard adjustment to get used to the NIV because it's quite a bit of different. I've come to really appreciate and really, really care for it deeply. So if you ask me what Bible do I read, if I'm being obnoxious, I'll say Greek. If I'm being honest, I'll say the NIV. But there's different Bibles for different situations and different kinds of preaching and different kinds of people. And so I'm glad that we have a plethora. <laughs> I do know what that means. <laughs> a plethora of Bibles. I'm thankful for that. Um, but obviously the NIV is in my go-to English. Anyway, five versions of translations. Okay, questions. <laughs> oh, um, there's a way that we're supposed to do this. Okay, you can win. Okay, so come on over here. Oh. You can sit down in here. We thought it would be easier with the size of the room to have uh, questions sent, so. Yeah. So, um, if you have any questions, just email them to me, jross37. I know it's a big school. I'm 37. My brother's in the back. He's in Watts. We got him with Verizon. I'm jross37 at liberty.edu, and we will take those questions. Um, and we have uh, several to start out. Um, before I do that, just want to say how grateful I have been to have Dr. Mounts here with us. He is uh, just a remarkable man, and um, I've always loved reading his stuff. I'm like, how can I teach this better? I was, he's like my cheap person. Like, how does he explain this? Oh, okay. So if you ever compare in my class what he said to what I say, they sometimes submerge. But I have just seen how much he loves God, how much he loves his word, and how much he loves the church to um, take time away from other areas that um, scholars like to do to help the church at large. And it's, it's just been a privilege for us to be here and have him. So um, we have several questions that have come through again, just pop them over to me. Um, one question uh, that we have is, um, actually I want to ask a question from a class earlier because it'll set up another question that somebody else asked. Uh, what happens when a translation committee selects one of these general categories and it comes to a passage in our church tradition that's mm -hmm. usually translated a certain way? How do you deal with those type of texts in a way that honors the church and the text? Translation is never about just one thing. Uh, there's always multiple things fighting on every verse. We want to stick to words, we want to stick to meaning, or, yeah, but the King James said it this way, that's what people are used to hearing, and it, it can get very, very complex. I don't know of any translation that would bow to tradition if they thought that the tradition was wrong. They're going to sometimes take their lumps and change familiar verses. A uh, great example is Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the NIV says something, in fact, yea, yea, though I walk through the, the dangerous and dark places, I will fear no evil. And on the, the cover of one famous magazine, we were all called cowards because we translated not death, but dark, lonely places. Well, the fact of the matter is that's what the Hebrew means. It doesn't mean death. The King James just mistranslated or interpreted or something. I don't know. And so when you see them, when you see something like that, even if tradition is strong, if you know it's wrong, they're going to change it. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you're very careful to do that. <laughs> you're very careful to, to play with your favorite verse. <laughs> we always are. We'll come to a famous verse. We'll maybe think, is there a way to tweak this to make it a little bit better? Well, is it worth the tweak? Is it, is, it, is it wrong the way it is? Do we have to change it? Do we have to upset people? So there's a, there's a balancing act. So if, if we think that the traditional interpretation is wrong, we'll change it. But we're very careful. 
Thank you. That was a great answer. Uh, this one is a related question, but it's a different issue that wasn't quite addressed. Uh, and so the question is, why is it uh, why is it some versions of the Bible do not have for yours is the kingdom power and glory forever in Matthew six thirteen? Yeah. What we get we get well everybody gets this question a lot because the NIV has the major market share. Um, most people level their guns at us. But uh, no modern translation has that verse. And you actually have the answer downstairs in the scriptorium because you have a Coverdale Bible, my most hated Bible. <laughs> you know what's famous about Coverdale? It's the first Bible, an uh, English Bible, to introduce versification. And Coverdale's translation is coming off a set of Greek manuscripts that have 17 sentences that were 17 sentences that were added later. And there's, this is this is not a debate. I mean, almost everyone knows this. And so things like uh, John 5, 4, uh, man was lying by the pool, and there's an angel that comes down and stirs up the water, and the first one gets healed, which is really kind of a weird idea if you stop to think about it. Um, it's not in any modern translation. It's in the footnote, but there's still that verse 4 is missing. Well, what happened? John um, 5, 4? John 5, isn't it? Yes. But, yeah, John 5, 4, that verse was in the Greek text that Coverdale translated. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory and forever was in the Greek text that Coverdale translated, and therefore he gave it a verse number. Um, since that time, uh, we have discovered a lot better manuscripts, a lot older manuscripts, a lot of manuscripts that have not been changed as much in the history of the transmission of the text. And if you look at the best and earliest manuscripts, those verses aren't there. So we put them in the footnotes out of deference to the King James, but we know that Jesus didn't say that. We know that John didn't have the woman in adultery uh, passage. We know that Mark didn't have a passage about handling snakes and drinking venom. Um, and so, but the problem is Coverdale gave them verse numbers because we have different Greek texts that we use, better Greek texts. They don't have those verses. We, the verse references are still there. The translation is in the footnotes, uh, but they're not in the text. Great. I think that actually also answers the second question that was posted, which was why some versions don't have certain endings in right. the different spots. It's Mark, six, Mark 16 and John 8, the woman caught in adultery, um, are the two big passages. But again, there's no debate. We, we just know for sure that they're not original. Um, the next size passage is two and a half verses, and then after that it's a verse or a phrase that we're not sure of. Um, we have another question about Amplified versions. Where do they fit, and what is your take on them? You know, I've never read the Amplified version much. Um, there, is a, there is a fallacy, if you read Don Carson's book on exegetical fallacies, he talks about this, that a, a Greek word can have all of its possible meanings in any one context. And the, the problem is, well, that's not true. Uh, the word was going to have one meaning in its context. And if you use an amplified to say, well, it's kind of like this, it's kind of like this, it's kind of like this, that's, that's, I think it's okay. But when you look at all the options they give and say, oh, the Greek word means all these things, that's the problem. So I think you just have to read the amplified carefully. It's trying, it's, it's hitting at the meaning of the Greek word from different angles, but the Greek word just has that one meaning. I think I'd say preacher if I was a Southern preacher. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have another question for you. Um, what What would you say the value is for uh, learning Greek? <laughs> <laughs> if anybody doesn't know, I teach um, Hebrew in the grad school. He was just chicken scratch. Is it a language? Yeah. <laughs> Greek makes perfectly good sense. Perfectly natural. Um, we're, we're, it, it's, an, it's an interesting issue. Uh, I've written two levels of Greek textbooks, so I can answer from both. Yeah, I, yeah if you're going to be a, a preaching pastor, especially if you're going to, if you... If you want to do, if you don't want to just, it's a distinction between preaching and pastoring. 
Uh, if, if it's a big enough church, I was given 30 hours a week to prepare sermons. I was a preaching pastor, and I, I absolutely loved the situation I was in. And I don't know how you could preach at that level without knowing Greek and Hebrew. <clears throat> it is the first four-fifths of the book, right? Amen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, my Hebrew is not very good, but I have friends on translation committees whose Hebrew is perfect, and I could always call them, uh, which I did. I, if you're going to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, I don't know how you do that on English. I just, I don't know how you would do it on English. Um, but there's a lot of other roles in the church, uh, pastoring roles, that are not going to give you the time to really stay up on your Greek. And for you, I wrote a book called Greek for the Rest of Us. And it's basically a tools book where learn enough Greek to use accordance and logos intelligently. Do Greek word studies. Uh, the book you've been, yeah, that you were carrying around. Uh, the bigger book. Um, to be able to enter into some of the discussion. And I think that you can, you can learn enough Greek to really read good commentaries and do Greek word studies without costing an arm and a leg. And so I think there's value in both of those. The, the problem is when you get up to preach or you get up to teach and you've, I was going to pick out a commentary rather than a bit or not, um, you, you pick some of these lay commentaries and you don't know whether they're right or wrong and you don't have the ability to really check whether they're right or wrong. That's where not having the tools, the hermeneutics tools and the language tools can really hurt you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and knowing and knowing the Greek doesn't keep you from making the errors. <laughs> okay, but it, it can lessen the possibility. I, I shared with the class earlier. I listen. We have a, my wife and I have a pastor. We love to listen to. I won't tell you who it is, but he's really, really, really good, and he just doesn't make mistakes. And that's why I was floored when he made a mistake. And the other day he was preaching about uh, the calming of the sea, and the disciples saying, "Jesus, don't you care about us?" And he went off in a different direction with his sermon. But in Greek, you can indicate the expected answer. And the disciples' question expects the answer, yes. It's a wonderful affirmation of faith. Because they knew that Jesus cared for them. They knew that Jesus was going to take care of them. And they're looking at the storm. The boat's starting to sink. And Why, you, you, but you care about us. It's a wonderful affirmation of faith. He made a, he made a very good preacher. made a mistake because he didn't check the Greek on that. And I know he knows that rule. So there's a lot of spiritual value to you. Yeah, it's just how close do you want to get to the text? You fall in love with your perfect co-ed friend, or you're at liberty here, and, and you just you just love Mary Sue so much, you just can't see straight, and you just you just love her, and you love her, but she speaks Swahili. <laughs> I don't know if Mary Sue is a Swahili man, but I don't, don't think it is. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to learn Swahili because your beloved, that is her native language. It's how she most naturally expresses herself. And you don't want to get stuck with her stammering through English. You will learn Swahili if you truly love Mary Sue. <laughs> Do you love Jesus? <laughs> First of all, there's, there's this massive debate in some areas about uh, King James only. I really encourage you, if you can, do not get involved. Um, they, they, some of these people will uh, question your salvation if you don't read the King James. They'll say the King James is inspired, which is ludicrous. English wasn't a language until a thousand years after the writing of the New Testament. Um, and the discussions can get harmful and hurtful. And unless... Your dad is a preacher in a King's Holy Church or something like that. I just encourage you to stay away from that discussion. It's, it's, I've never seen a discussion turn, turn beneficial. Um, anyway, the, uh, the, the issue of the King James is, do you know what superfluity of naughtiness is? Yeah, it's, it's James 3.1. Don't you know your Bible? I mean, the language just doesn't work anymore. And that's the I main, yes, yes, Shakespeare's day is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful English. And it's an English of a bygone era, and it does no value 
to continue to use phrases like superfluity of naughtiness if people don't know what it means. The purpose of the translation is to convey the clear message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not to adhere to a certain tradition. It's just not. And so um, that's part of the problem. The, the other problem with the, with the King James is that it's based on a different set of Greek manuscripts than all of the modern manuscripts are, are based. And so if you're going along and you're preaching, Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration and the disciples can't exercise the demon. And Jesus says, this kind cannot come out except by prayer and fasting. And you do a Bible study, you do preach a sermon on the role of fasting. You're John Piperite and you like fasting and you, you really you hit hard fasting. And nine tenths of the people looking at you and says, my Bible only says prayer. So you get those kind of textual issues. So if you're going to use the King James, uh, I used to, I taught for five years in a school up in uh, north of where we were. Jim's an old friend of mine from, from Portland, but I taught a school in Tacoma. It's almost all black. And the tradition there is very, very strong towards the King James. And I said, okay, if you use the King James, will you please at, use, at least use the new King James so your people can understand it? Tradition is very strong in the black church. It's a very difficult transition for some of them to make. I think most of them stuck with the King James. But the, the problem is there's, there's the Greek texts are different, so you're going to get caught. So if you do preach or you teach out of the King James, or even the New King James, uh, check the NIV. Make sure that all the words are still there. Um, and don't go off teaching on a phrase that isn't in most people's Bible. Okay, thanks. All right, um, we have another question on ambiguity. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, so uh, this question reads, uh, you mentioned rejecting ambiguity for the sake of the plain gospel for children. What would you say about the literal use of ambiguity for a mature audience? Yeah. It's really hard to know whether a passage actually is ambiguous or not. I mean, it's just hard. We don't know whether it's ambiguous because we don't know the culture, and then we don't know the meanings of the words, um, or, or other things. So you first of all have to determine, is it really ambiguous or not? Uh, the rule in the ESV was if we thought it was ambiguous, we looked for an equally ambiguous English expression to convey the same ambiguity and leave it up to you to do. Um, that was the philosophy of the ESV, it's fine. Uh, it's addressing an older audience. It's addressing an audience that wants to work to understand the gospel, that they, they want to study at that level. Um, that's fine. That's what they do. Uh, the New International Version, on the other hand, is the New International Version. The largest block of English speakers in the world is in India. Second largest is soon to be Africa. And the NIV is a different kind of translation. It's an international. And so we look for ways to express the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ in ways that people in northern India and Nepal can understand and people in Nairobi can understand. We have two questions. I'm sorry, there were more. But we have about time for two questions left. So I'm going to do one that sort of piggybacks on that question. And uh, I think this is a really practical question for us. What is the best way to help someone who resents the Bible because they struggle with reading comprehension? Oh, yeah. Um, get them an NIRV. It's a, the reader's version of the NIV. It's designed specifically for English as a second language uh, readers. And it is uh, it's down a few age grades in reading comprehension. Uh, and what's nice about the NIRV is that... You, Almost anybody can understand it. And as they grow up, and if they want to move into the NIV, it's an easy shift, because they're, they're so much alike. Uh, NLT works really well as well in that situation. I don't know what the grade reading, I think the NLT is third grade. I mean, their sentences are short, uh, simpler words, simpler constructions, uh, very, very clear. So I would, I, would, I would do that. But you know, we used to learn to read by reading the Bible. That was, those were our graded readers. Um, and so you learned it. So there's, what better way to learn to read than read the Bible? And so uh, get them an NRV, uh, sit down with them and mark. Not John. 
uh, Mark, uh, not Leviticus, <laughs> uh, pick your passages carefully and, and just say, hey, let's just use this to learn from you. But you, you've got to pick the right translation. I'm going to ask one last question, and it's uh, just for me, so we can continue gaining wisdom. How do you, and this is emphasis in the original, how do you study the word? <laughs> uh, well, I just read the NIV and whatever they say, I go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I force myself to read good commentaries. I don't read lay commentaries. I read commentaries that force me into the Greek text. Um, I love to, we've talked about in class, do phrasing. I love to lay out the text graphically, see what's the main thought. And so I, I have some exegetical methods that I use that require me to be in Greek. Um, but it's, it's really hard for me to read Greek devotionally. I know some people do. Do you read Hebrew devotionally? You read it good. Oh, that, you're, you're better than I am that because what happens with me is when I try to read a devotion, I always end up pulling out Dan Wallace's grammar to figure out some odd genitive. And it's really hard for me to stay devotional. Now, maybe I don't have enough depth. No, maybe I don't have enough depth. What I love. Yeah. I'm not thinking those questions. What I love to do is compare translations. I really, really enjoy comparing translations. And so. I am working very slowly through the CSB, and I will see something that's different from what I'm used to. I'm like, oh, well, that's a different way of looking at it. And then I'll, I'll look at the Greek, or I'll look at the NIV, or some other translations. And the whole process of comparing translations is a really good Bible study. Now, you've got you to have your main one, the one you memorized from, the one you marked from, the one you know, I know that verse is in the upper right-hand corner. You know, you, you need that Bible, right? Uh, but it's, it's so helpful to read what other, what other people are saying because they, they'll just have a little twist sometimes. And you go, oh. It's like this, this I just saw this thing on the, the Apostles' Confession of Faith in the Storm. And it was reading another version. I'm like, oh, is there a new one in the Greek? There's a new one in the Greek. I didn't know that. So I love comparing translations and trying to see why they're different, and that's my, that's a Bible study. But I normally end up in Greek just to make sure. Thank you so much for the discussions. We're gonna have Dr. Mueller um, close us in prayer for the linguistics, but before we do that, can we give a nice uh, thank you to from your holy heaven you wrote us a letter and we, we this is such a grace such a gift to us you spoke to us 1500 pages of text you loved us that much you wanted to communicate yourself to us thank you father for your word Enable us to fall in love each day more and more with that word. To study it. To look deeply. To study the original languages. To compare the translations. To uh, dig deeper and deeper. Thank you for Dr. Mounts and for his work that he has put in for many years to opening up the details of that word to us. and Teach us how to study Greek. Thank you for the many who have throughout the years uh, slaved with, with great labor to uh, translate the word uh, from your heart to ours. We pray, Father, that you would continue to bless his work, and we pray that you would enable us each day to just fall more and more in love with your word. Bless our day tomorrow as we hear again from Dr. Mounts and we just pray your blessings upon his time here. Enable us to be a blessing to one another. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.